Hello, welcome back to episode eight of Kintsugi Talks podcast. This is your girl Soroya, and today is going to be a bit of a special episode. Today, today is going to be like a story time episode. Now, if you follow me on my Instagram, you will see that I posted the schedule of what type of episodes will be going up. So. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it'll be topic episodes. So like yesterday's episode was the topic of Jesus and therapy. And Tuesdays and Thursdays will be story time episodes. And today is Tuesday, so it's a story time episode for today. And the story that I'll be sharing today, well, testimony story I'll be sharing today, is of how I was homeless for two years. Now, before I get into it, I want to make sure that everyone who is listening to this is actually following me and is subscribed to listening to my podcast. You can listen to this podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Kintsugi Talks Pod. That is K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I Talks Pod. That is all together, no space, and it is all lowercase letters on Instagram. Now... Without further ado, let's get into the episode. So to start off with this story, let us go to the beginning of how I even ended up in the in the shelter system. So I grew up in the same apartment in Bronx, New York. Um, Yes, I'm a Bronx native. Uh, I grew up in the same childhood home on the same block for pretty much my entire life. And I had to leave my childhood home. I don't want to get into too much details about why that happened because um, it is a bit personal, a bit too personal. But I did have to leave my childhood home under um, very unfortunate circumstances. And from there, I had to move in with my brother and his girlfriend in her house. This was in like summer going into fall of the year 2015. And that brother that I lived with for a short amount of time was very abusive. He was verbally, emotionally, and sexually abusive. Um, And around this time, he had started doing drugs. He had used me to try to get money from me. um, And the money that I would get, I wasn't working at this time. So the money that I would get from, uh, I would get from when my mom, who adopted me, she would get money from the government because when you adopt a child, they give you money to help you like raise and take care of the child and um, my mother had passed away in um in 2014 so I was still getting the checks um in my name uh and I stopped receiving those checks when I was 21 around yeah like 21 years old I stopped getting those checks but at this time I was still getting the checks And so he was using me to try to get this money for me. And when I found out what he was doing, I left. Um, And from there, I moved in with my aunt. And I say that with quotation marks because she was not related to my mother in that way. Um, We, me and my sister, we just called her aunt. Um, And one of my other brothers was actually already living with her, like helping her out. Um... This happened in the winter of 2015. This happened um, This happened after my birthday, which is November 30th, but before Christmas. Um, and now we're going to fast forward a bit into uh, next year. The, the next year, which would be 2016. Uh, so it was a day where she had family coming in from out of town for some type of family event. I think it was like a wedding or something. I don't really remember. And um, they were going to stay in a hotel, but then she offered to let them stay in her house. 
which pretty much and she pretty much gave me and my brother no choice but to say oh you guys have to leave so my brother was able to like find himself a room he could rent I had nowhere to go um so and even my brother had told me that I was like you're probably gonna have to like live in a shelter system um and you're probably wondering why I didn't go to any other family member was because my trust was betrayed by them and I didn't have a good relationship with them. So I didn't want to stay with them. Um, and I had friends I could have went to, but I didn't want to feel like I was mooching off of them. And also their houses were just too small with like all the stuff I had and I didn't want to crowd their space. So I went into the shelter system. This was in April of 2016. The first shelter that I, the first type of shelter that I stayed in was a general intake shelter. This one was located in the Bronx. Now there is different type of shelters out there and I will explain um, the types that I stayed in throughout me uh, telling this story. So again, the first one that I stayed in was a general intake shelter in the Bronx. Um, and now at this time I had gotten a job. I had actually gotten a job in, um, in January of 2016. I forgot to mention that earlier. Sorry. I got a job in January of 2016. Um, I was working at the Intrepid Museum and, um, because I was working at the time, I was able to move into a shelter for working people about two weeks later, about two weeks after I had moved into the general intake shelter. Um, and the shelter for working people was in Manhattan. Now, working people meaning people who have a job, people who have an income coming in. And the way that this shelter operated um, was that there was different social um, workers, case workers that were on your case. And because this was a shelter for people who had some type of income coming in because they had a job, they could help them work up into um, having some type of savings plan and to get them a housing voucher to where they can move into their own place. Now, a housing voucher is pretty much a type of voucher of some type of housing program that helps you pay for only a small amount of like the whole rent of an apartment or wherever you would be moving into. Now, uh, in August of 2016, I got fired from the job um, because I was in a really, 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 really bad um, emotional place. Um, My depression was really bad. I was already in a depressive state starting that job, but it just, I fell deeper and deeper into it. Um, and I was calling out a lot. Um, there were days at the job where it's like, I had no energy. Like I had to take breaks a lot because I was just like crying all the time. And because of that, I got fired. And around this time, I was very heavily involved in ministry and it was helping me get through what I was dealing with to a certain point. Um, it was, yeah, it was helping me get, it was helping me get through like a lot of things to a certain point. And, um, what had made this difficult for me was, um, for those that don't know, shelters in New York City, well, I think shelters everywhere, but just from what I know, from what I experienced, shelters in New York City have a curfew. So you're allowed to like leave and go outside and do what you want, but you have to be back by a certain time. The time for me was 10 p.m. or I could possibly lose my bed, lose my bed in the shelter and have to be transferred to somewhere else. Um, and the church that I was attending at the time, uh, again, I was very heavily involved in ministry there. I was in the worship team. I was teaching Bible class. I was somewhat of a youth leader, but not really. That's just how I kind of see it. Um, and the, 
there was like three services in the week. Um, Sundays, there was three services in one day. Sundays was a day where it's like I was able to like get home on time and not, well, get back to the shelter on time and not worry about it. Tuesdays and Fridays were the days that were very stressful because of time. So Tuesdays, they had a service from 7 to 9.30 slash 10 p.m. Fridays, they had a service from 8 to 10 p.m. And the um, at a, up, up until a certain um, time um, for uh, the Tuesday service, I would literally only be able to stay for the worship. Like, I would, like, worship with the team, and then as soon as the worship finished, I would have to get my stuff and leave because I had to be back at the shelter by 10 p.m. And the shelter I was living in was in Manhattan, and the church that I attended was in the Bronx. So I had to account for the travel time as well. And for the Friday services, yeah, up until a certain time when I was staying in the shelter, I was actually allowed to get passes to stay out later. So like how I had to do for the Tuesday service, I would have to leave early or leave at a certain time. Or fortunately, I would have like a friend who would be willing to drive me to the shelter and things like that. But because at um, a certain point I was getting like the passes to stay out later, I didn't have the worry of having to get back at a certain time. Now, in April of 20, I mean, sorry, no, not, not that part. Um, in uh, November of 2016, we're still in 2016. So in November of 2016, um, my depression was getting really bad. It was getting really, really bad. Um, I was in a very dark place, um, to the point where I wasn't leaving my room. Um, I would only go outside when I had to. I was, it was hard for me to even want to get up and take a shower. Um, so in November 2016, I had a suicide attempt and because I, at that point, it had been a few years since my last suicide attempt. So I willingly, I voluntarily put myself in the hospital because I knew that there was something like wrong. Now, at this point, you would think I would know what depression was. I didn't know what depression was because growing up, we didn't talk about stuff like that. And also no one knew what that stuff was because people didn't really take that type of stuff seriously. So that type of stuff wasn't talked about. So yes, I was put into a um, psychiatric ward for two weeks. Um, this was actually two weeks before my birthday. Um, before my birthday of that year that I was put into the hospital. Um... And then now we can go fast forward to April of 2017. April of 2017, I was diagnosed with cancer for the first time. Um, don't worry, there will be an episode where I talk about how I had cancer. Not once, but three times. I had cancer three times. Um, the type of cancer that I was diagnosed with was B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And... When this happened, suicidal ideations and self-harm had started up for me again, along with um, disordered eating habits. Um, at this point, I just really kept to myself a lot, and I just dealt with a very heavy feeling of feeling lonely. Also, at this point, I had left the church that I was uh, previously attending. Um that could be another episode of why I had um, left church. If you would like that to be another episode, uh, let me know and I will gladly do an episode on it. Now, um, during my stay in the shelters that I lived in, in total, I lived in four different shelters. I witnessed, uh, I witnessed a lot of, um, a lot of crazy things and I had to endure a lot of things um there were security guards that were having sex with the people living in the shelter there was drug and alcohol abuse there were fights 
Um, I caught food poisoning on multiple occasions from the food that they would serve there. Um, there was abuse of power from the people who would like run these shelters. Um, I mainly stayed in shelters that was like for women. So there was really only women there. The only men that were there were like the security guards or the, the caseworkers that worked there. Um, and, um, I also endured a lot of personal, um, turmoil. So, um, to bring it back to my brother who I was living with at the time, who was very abusive, there was a point where, um, he actually sent people after me to hurt me. Um, because like how I said, he was trying to use me to get money out of me. And, um, I didn't tell that brother, like, what shelters I was living in or even, like, where I was, like, in the city. So, he sent people after me to hurt me. He sent three people after me. The first person, um, and also, actually, sorry, before I even get into that, um, you're probably wondering, like, how would he send people after you? Um, people from the streets, people he was friends with, people who were, I guess you would call thugs, gangsters, whatever, people who were just doing stuff like that. Now, the first person he had sent after me was someone who um, just kind of, like, roughed me up a bit. I wasn't jumped, per se. Like, he did sneak up on me, and he did, like, rough me up, and he had, like, his hand around my neck, and pretty much he was like, oh, like, you thought you could get away from him, and all this other stuff, pretty much threatening me. That is, like, you know that he can find you. Like, do you forget who your brother is? And stuff like that. That was the first occurrence. The second occurrence was um, I was jumped, so physically beaten this time, and I was raped. And in the third occurrence, uh, I was jumped and raped again. And with the third occurrence, the second occurrence of being raped, I actually ended up pregnant. And I didn't find out I was pregnant until I was a month along. I had went to a doctor's appointment and they told me that it's like, oh, um, I was like, oh, we see that you're one month pregnant. And I was like, wait, what, what I'm, I'm what? And they said, were you not aware that you were pregnant? And I'm like, um, that no, I wasn't. And I didn't tell them that I was like, oh, like because of me being raped or whatever. Like I already, in my mind, I already made the connection that I was like, oh my God, like I'm pregnant by my rapist. And, um, the doctor was giving me all this information of like a guy like, like an OBGYN and like a healthcare plan and stuff like that for like me having a baby or whatever. And I listened to her and I was like, mm hmm, mm hmm, okay. But in my head, I'm like, I'm getting an abortion. Like, I cannot have this baby. I cannot have this baby. Like, absolutely not. And now, I already know I'm going to get people who will criticize me because of the fact that I got an abortion. Um, I actually shared about this on my TikTok, um, and I had a few comments say that it's like, oh, an abortion is murder, it is a sin, like, you shouldn't have done that in the first place, yada, yada, yada. Now, I've made it clear that I am a person of the faith, I am Christian. Do I personally believe that abortion is murder? Yes. And to add on to that, I also personally believe that the only reason the only good reason there is to abort a child is if you have been sexually abused in the cases of rape or incest or something like that that is the only it per, me personally me personally and if you don't agree with that then that's fine you can agree to disagree okay that's that's totally fine now at that time This is when I had like just started my relationship with my now boyfriend of five years and I was broke. I was emotionally unstable and I was homeless. 
And I knew I could not bring a child into this world with me living under those circumstances. So I made the decision to get an abortion. Now, did it take me a long time to forgive myself for what I did? Yes. And so now I'm in the place where it's like, I don't feel guilty about that anymore because I forgave myself. And most importantly, God forgave me. So with that being said, let us get back into the story. So the last thing I mentioned was of the different things that I witnessed in the shelter system, like the security guards having sex with people, drug and alcohol abuse, all that other stuff. So in the spring of 2017, I was transferred to a different general intake shelter in Manhattan. Why? I don't know. I don't know why I was transferred to that shelter, honestly. And um, as I was staying there for a few days, I got interviewed to possibly move into a shelter for people with mental health slash illness challenges and issues. Because the people at the shelter were aware that I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. So um, I got interviewed and then in August of 2017, I moved to the shelter that I had interviewed for in Brooklyn. And then at this shelter, now this shelter specifically, again, was for people who have mental health, mental illness challenges. So at this shelter, there was um, a psychiatrist and a physical care doctor on site. And at this shelter, I started taking medication regularly for my depression and anxiety. Now, um, from January of 2018 to February of 2018, I started going on different interviews for potential permanent housing. Now, this is a process for anyone who is in the shelter system that they will go on interviews or do like questionnaires and stuff like that for housing. Like what borough would they prefer to live in? Like what room apart, how many rooms in the apartment or housing do they want? Like what's like their income or if they have any income at all stuff like that all that type of stuff is like different factors also if they're receiving public assistance like receiving food stamps receiving cash assistance or not from the government so i went on three different interviews for potential permanent housing so the first one was for a studio apartment in brooklyn the second one was for a dormitory style housing in harlem Now, dormitory style is exactly how it sounds like. It was like a dormitory, like how they have it on a college campus. So one side was for women, the other side was for men. I would have gotten my own room with my own, like my own room with a bed, a fridge, like stuff to put my clothes, but there would be communal spaces, spaces that I had to share with other people. Like the bathroom I would have had to share, the place to cook food I would have had to share, the place to like chill and hang out I would have had to share, and the place to eat my food I would have had to share, but I was also allowed to eat in my room. Now, that one, I would have had to pay $600 a month to be able to stay there. And then number three was a studio apartment in the Bronx. And I'm saying these in the order of when I interviewed for these places. So the second option, the dormitory housing in Harlem, we, me and my uh, caseworker that I had at the time, we already like kind of just crossed that out as an option because I did not have a job. I did not have any income. The only income I was getting was the bit of money that I was getting from cash assistance, which is which was a part of public assistance from the government and it wasn't enough for me to get by. So that option was out. So it was between the studio apartment in Brooklyn and the studio apartment in the Bronx. Now we did the paperwork for both of them. Um, and I was really like rooting for the studio apartment in the Bronx because Like I said in the beginning, I'm a Bronx native. The Bronx is my home and I'm more familiar with the Bronx because I really wanted to move back to the Bronx. Now, the issue is that um, the apartment in the Bronx, the paperwork on their end, because I did everything I had to do like very quickly. I was on it. 
okay? I was on it. They were on their end being very slow with the paperwork. Now, then, um, so around this time, when I'm, like, kind of waiting to hear, like, a which place I'm going to get accepted to it or whatever, um, I got a letter in the mail to attend a very important meeting. It was a mandatory meeting regarding housing. So, of course, I had to go because I want housing, you know? So I go there with my caseworker, and I find out in this meeting that I got accepted for Section 8. Now, for those who are not familiar with Section 8, Section 8 is a housing program that allows you to only pay pay for a small amount of rent out of the total amount of rent there is. So let's say, and this also depends on the amount of income that you get also and how many people are living in your household. So let's say the place you live in is like 1500 a month with section eight, you'll only pay about like 300, 400 a month. So I find that I got accepted for section eight. And at this time, section eight, it was like pretty much closed. Like they weren't accepting new applicants or anything like that. But I found out that I was eligible for section eight because as an infant, I was in the foster care system because I'm adopted. That can be another story for another episode. If you would like me to share that story of me being adopted, let me know down below. And because I was at a young age, I was like 21, 22 living in a shelter system. So then we get back to the shelter and like a day later, literally, I find out that I got accepted to move in to the studio apartment in Brooklyn because I got accepted for Section 8. Now, I was happy that I got accepted for housing. I was really rooting for the one in the Bronx, but because the paperwork on their end was just taking too long, we just decided like we're gonna move in, we're gonna move into the studio apartment in Brooklyn. Like, let's go. So by March of 2018, I moved into my new apartment, which I currently live in. And I've been living here very happily in my little quaint little studio apartment. Um, 2018, 19, 20, 21. So like four years. Like this on um, this month, it'll make four years since I've moved into my apartment, which is crazy. Something else that I wanted to share, which I think would be just helpful to anyone who is possibly going through a situation that is similar um, whether you were dealing with homelessness or not so there was a point in time where um, when I was still attending my former church um, that um, a lady had offered me to move in with her And she said that I wouldn't have had to pay anything because she knew me from the church. And so she trusted me, like, that I was, like, a good person that could, like, live with her and stuff stuff like that. And um, in that moment, I wanted to say yes, but then I heard the Holy Spirit, clear as day, said no. Clear as day. And as I literally tried to open my mouth again to say, to say something, the Holy Spirit said no. And so in response to the lady offering me to live with her, I said, let me pray about it. And she said, okay. So I prayed about it for exactly three days, three days. Because I just, I simply just wanted the answer of why are you telling me no? Why can't I live with her? Like, what are you doing? Like, what, what are you planning on doing? Like, what is this, what is this for? What is this about? On the third day, that is a whole sermon title right there. On the third day. (laughs) I mean, cause a lot, a lot can happen in three days. Amen. Amen. But yes, on the third day, God told me that you need to be more dependent and obedient to me no matter what circumstance you're in, good or bad. 
I am having you stay in this predicament because this is going to help teach you. It's going to help teach you how to be dependent on me and me alone and not on just the people around you. And I had to sit with that. And I was like, you're right. I was like, he's right. You're right, God. And that's a problem that I've always had. I think when it comes to just um, the church setting and even outside the church setting, um, I leaned on people too much because I trusted people more than I trusted God. And that's when it became a problem with me in my relationship with God where I felt so far away from him. And God said that he's using this to bring me closer to him. And I will tell you, in those two years of me being homeless, and even in the period of time where I said that I left that former church, I left that church and didn't go to church again, didn't like attend a physical service for three years, I felt so much more closer to God than I ever did before. And... This is just to say that God knows what he's doing. God knows exactly what he's doing. God is not, God, God can never be confused. God is, there's no confusion in him. There's no confusing thing about him. God doesn't make mistakes. Everything about God is purposeful, meaningful, and beautiful. No matter how painful that process is like because there's no such thing as an easy process no such thing as an easy process and if someone ever tells you that like they went through an easy process of like healing or like forgiving someone that is that is a bold face lie because there is nothing easy about it nothing nothing easy about it at all but It did teach me how to trust God more. And it taught me how to fight. It taught me how to fight for myself. Because that was something that I never really did before. And by the grace of God. Giving me courage to take it day by day. Even with all the things that I endured and faced. I made it out. I made it out. And... I can now add that to my life story as a way that that God had my back and he always has. Well, that is it for today's episode of Kintsugi Talks. I really, really hope you enjoyed today's episode and hearing my story. Now remember, every Tuesday and Thursday is a story time slash testimony episode. And every Monday, Wednesday, Friday is a topic episode. You can listen to my podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at Kintsugi Talks Pod. That is K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I Talks Pod. That is all lowercase, all bunched together with no spaces on Instagram. And I will see you tomorrow, Wednesday, for the next episode. I won't tell you what it is you're gonna have to find out and see or if you follow me on instagram and saw my schedule post you'll know what it is already so until then god bless